Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining the VTC Wilderness Medicine Journal Club, April 2023. This month, we're covering sharks and other dangerous sea life. A little bit different than typical uh, situation for the month. We're going to start out with a student uh, presented a lecture about different animals you might encounter in the ocean and uh, other areas. And then we have a special guest joining us, Dr. Ben Abo, who I think most of you have heard of and have seen in some presentations in the past. Uh, he's led multiple Shark Week, sorry, Shark Week medical teams and is going to help us out with a lot of information he's gained and taught over the years. Uh, Julia, when you feel ready, take it away. All right, let me share my screen. All right, are you all able to see my PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah, we can. Okay, great. All right, so my name is Julia DeLuca. I am a second year medical student at Virginia Tech Corellian, and I'm gonna be talking about shark bites and other oceanic threats of penetrating wounds. So the reason I volunteered to present this today is because before going to medical school, I used to work at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California, and I worked in the education department there. So I taught a lot about marine biology and ecology. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest to report, but this is an overview of what I'm gonna be talking about. So a bulk of this presentation is going to be talking about sharks, um, how sharks hunt, different statistics about bites on humans. And then we're also gonna to briefly touch on sea lions and seals, sea urchins, barracuda, needlefish, eels, and sawfish. Okay, so first I'm just gonna jump right in and talk about shark teeth. And so what I like to tell people is that what the prey is for the different species are gonna dictate what their teeth evolve into. Um, so if you look at the white shark here, um, this is a zoomed in picture of what their teeth would look like. And we see that there are these serrated edges. I hope you could see my mouse. Um, and these serrated edges are really going to be helpful in the sharks being able to bite through um, flesh or muscle, blubber, things of that nature. Um, versus if you look over at this shark right here, their teeth uh, are missing those serrated edges. They just have one big point on them. And so this is going to be for catching on to things that would kind of be slippery. So think of a fish that would swim really fast, or maybe even a stingray that has a mucus coating on its outside that makes it more slippery. So this kind of teeth is going to be more helpful to grasping onto those different kinds of prey to penetrate into them and make it so that they can't get away. And then this last shark over here, they have a lot of different teeth and a lot of people are not familiar with teeth like this on sharks, but they're more flat and in a lot of rows. And this is going to be good for mashing things. So these sharks are gonna be more so eating off of the floor of the ocean. And when their jaws line up, it's going to um, help them with cracking things open. So think of like crabs and crab shells and being able to get to the meat inside of them. And so we can imagine that with all of these different teeth, this is going to elicit different bites on humans. So the sharks with the flat teeth, they are not usually up by the coast. So people have a lot less interaction with them. There's not very many documented cases of them biting people. But if you could imagine if someone was to stick their finger in their mouth, it would probably give them a crushing injury. It would crush their bones versus these other sharks, they would penetrate the skin. And here are some examples of what that could look like. So here we can see that there's these different puncture wounds on this person. So you can imagine that it would be from a shark that has more pointy teeth um, versus these ones over here have a lot more damage done to them. So we can imagine that these the teeth that did this would maybe have serrated edges on them. Um, you actually would not be able to identify the particular shark that bit a person. Um, some people like to think that you can do that, um, but the sharks, their teeth are constantly falling out and being replaced. Um, so you can't use the actual bites to identify the shark or even the species necessarily, um, but you can get some hints about what kind of teeth may have bitten them. Okay, so just an overview of how sharks hunt. They use a lot of different senses. So 
They use their scent, uh, their sense of scent, uh, sight. They follow their food. They have something called a lateral line and ampullae of Lorenzini. So I will talk about those a little bit more in depth. So first, sharks have a very keen sense of scent. They can smell blood or oils coming from their prey um, from a pretty far distance. So there's not much that needs to be in the water for them to be able to smell it, for them to be able to track down where it's coming from. And then there's also visual acuity. I am, I always get a little hesitant to talk about visual acuity, although it, it is a fact that they have good eyesight. They have these reflective layers within their eyes to make it so that they can see in low light. They have rods and cones and it's debated if they can see in color. Um, and also flat-headed sharks can see 360 degrees around them. So a flat-headed shark like this hammerhead right here, um, it wasn't too long ago that biologists were thinking that there was a really big um, blind spot in front of them that they couldn't see this area. But what they were neglecting to take into account is that when these sharks are swimming, they're undulating their bodies throughout the water and this allows them to get a bigger picture all the way around them. But why I hesitate to talk about the visual acuity sometimes is because if there is murky waters, um, the sharks can opt out of using their visual acuity as one of the top senses that they use. And so I have a little video right here to kind of show you how um, a shark might navigate that if they can't really see. Okay. So I don't know if you guys were able to see that or appreciate that the shark kind of comes out really last second right, from right behind the diver and they bump the diver. And that is actually an exploratory behavior. Um, so they're not quite sure what the diver is. And so um, they are doing a little bump just to kind of get an idea of what it is. Sharks don't have hands. They can't grab onto the person and feel what they look like. Um, so they're really uh, options are to either bump or to bite. Um, so sometimes if there's not very good water quality, um, then they're going to have to uh, explore their prey other than using their eyesight. Okay, another thing that they do is that they follow their food. So um, if there's a food hotspot, such as maybe a seal island um, or something like this, where there's a lot of sea lions congregated, they could stalk around this area. Um, there's, they're going to be watching out for the migrations of their prey. So if prey are swimming long distances, the sharks might follow behind them. And also they can catch on to when humans are chumming water. This can be either for tourist purposes, trying to attract sharks, or um, just for, for fishing, people throwing um, the products of their fishing overboard. And so sharks can catch on to that um, routine going on, and that can influence their swimming patterns. All right, and then they, the sharks also have something called a lateral line. So this is actually seen in some form in a lot of different fish. Um, so here it's an actual physical line on the side of their body. And these are pores that detect changes in water flow. And you can see that down here in the shark nicely. And the way that this works is um, these pores are going to help them uh, sense different changes in motion, vibration and pressure in the water because water is gonna flow into the pores and move this hair cell right here. So similar to human um, hair cells in their ears that the sound waves will physically push the hair cells, um, the water is gonna do that in this case. And then this will send a signal uh, to the shark and let it know that there is a disturbance in the water and that they should go investigate that. Okay, they also have um, these other pores called the ampullae of Lorenzini. And these are gonna be concentrated on the nose of the shark. And instead of being mechanoreceptive, uh, like the other ones, these are electroreceptive. So these pores have a jelly-like substance in them. And this is going to be able to detect changes in current in the water. So this makes it so if there is a prey that's hiding from them, these pores can detect their heartbeats and also muscle contractions. So this is gonna make it a lot easier for the sharks to be able to find those um, prey that are good at hiding. Okay, so does anyone have any questions so far about any of the physiology uh, behind how the sharks are hunting?
Okay, then I can go ahead and keep going. Okay, so next I want to talk about um, some definitions for different shark attacks. So first we have unprovoked shark attacks, which basically means the humans at the wrong place at the wrong time. They're in the water and they did nothing that brought on the shark. Um, this is in contrast to a provoked shark attack, which so, and for some reason, a human influenced the shark and had them come investigate and accidentally bite them. So usually this is either in the form of um, the human coming in between the shark and its food, and also a human maybe threatening the shark and making them feel that they need to be on the defense. So this can be from harassing or trying to touch a shark. If you can imagine someone, there's people who try to swim with the sharks, take selfies with the sharks. Uh, this can make them feel kind of cornered and have to protect themselves. People who are trying to take hooks out of sharks' mouths, even though they're trying to help, the shark is still can still get scared. Um, oftentimes, we see bites on uh, people who are spear fishing, and this is because when there is a fish at the end of that spear, the fish is uh, going to be flopping around. This is going to send sound out through the water. There's going to be blood in the water, and this is going to excite the sharks. And so. Um, that human is in that environment and the shark can mistake them as the thing that is um, making all the blood and the noise. And then also some people, uh, they might try to hand feed the sharks and the sharks might nip them a little bit uh, when they do this. So we definitely don't want to be doing anything that is uh, interfering with shark and sharks in their feeding. Okay, and then there's also exploratory and predatory bites. So I kind of touched a little bit on the exploratory behavior of that bumping, um, but kind of a rule of thumb is that when a shark bites on an extremity, so maybe a foot or a hand, um, this oftentimes is an exploratory behavior. So if you can see right here, it, to me, it looks like a shark teeth is kind of like raking the foot. Um, and so rather than chomping down on it and just taking a bite right then and there. So this is more exploratory. The shark is trying to see what this person is. And then if a bite is more on the trunk or on the gluteal region, this is seen as uh, more of an attempt at hunting. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some shark statistics um, from 2022. So worldwide, we saw 91 shark attacks, um, with nine of these being fatal, and 16 of them were provoked. Most of these shark attacks were from the United States and almost half of those being from Florida. Um, Hawaii was also notable to have um, five out of the six of their attacks being provoked. Um, and I thought this was kind of funny. I saw there was one source that claimed that being a female was protective against shark bites um, because 80% of shark bites are on men. And I think with the more uh, reasonable explanation for this is that uh, surfing is a male dominated sport. So a lot of the people out surfing are men and also a lot of fishermen are men as well. So they tend to be in the water a little bit more often. Um, but yes, most of these shark bites are going to be on men. Okay, and then here we can see which sharks are the ones who are doing most of these shark bites. So here we see the different species of shark, what their common name is. And then these are all unprovoked bites and the totals. And um, at first glance, so we see that the white shark is on top followed by tiger and bull sharks. And then if you look at what's next, uh, the next category of sharks, it's actually a combination of several different sharks. Um, these sharks are really hard for people to identify them. And so they just kind of group them together. But we see going from number three to number four, there's quite a bit of a drop off. And at first, it also might look like the white shark uh, is going to be the scariest of the sharks. But when you look at it, they don't convert all of their bites to fatalities. Um, so if it were me and I had to choose to swim in the water with one of these, I would probably pick the white shark, actually. I think that they would be the less scary of the three. And so why is it that these three sharks are the ones that are the most deadly and the ones that are um, biting the most? It, some of the main reasons are just their mass. They are, they, they're creatures who weigh a ton, if not more, uh, their power. Some of these sharks can swim between 25, 30, 35 miles per hour in short bursts. Um, so that weight and that speed coming at you, that in and of itself is going to create damage. And then also they all have those serrated teeth that we talked about in the beginning. 
So um, having those come into contact with human flesh at all of that um, speed and power is going to be um, very damaging to people. And then just some more um, facts about each of those top three. So for the white sharks, they can be found in a lot of different waters just because they do follow around their prey. They're not really ones that have um, preferences to different water temperatures. They are, they're pretty uh, easy going. But we know that they have uh, nurseries in Southern California and in New York. And we know that these are some of the most populated places in the United States. And in those places, that's where the juveniles are, which are the clumsy sharks, which are the ones that are just learning how to do their hunting. So they might be um, a little bit more exploratory and uh, make some mistakes and invite some people. Um, I, where I used to live in California, um, there was Surf City USA near there in Huntington Beach. And a lot of people I knew there said that they constantly were swimming up uh, with juvenile great whites. And there's also a pupping ground there for stingrays. So the great whites were hanging out there waiting for the stingrays to come out of the wetland so that they could eat them. Okay, and then tiger sharks. These sharks like to be more in warm waters. Um, so I would like to think that they are kind of synonymous with Florida. So I think it makes sense that Florida has the most um, shark bites. And what I think is interesting about them is that they are really not picky eaters at all. They eat whatever. And so there was this publication done and the author wrote a blog post about it. And what I thought was so funny was that he talked a lot about that he kept finding oranges in these tiger sharks stomachs. And uh, so it wasn't even the plastic in the trash taking up uh, almost a quarter of what they eat. It was the oranges that were really surprising. So somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico, there is a consistent uh, offloading of oranges there and uh, they, they're they not sure why but so tiger sharks they just uh, they eat whatever's there and then we have the bull sharks and the bull sharks are one of the very few sharks that can live in both um, salt water and fresh water and they can do this through some specialized rectal glands and kidneys that regulate their salt concentration that other sharks don't have and so the implications of this is that um they can swim up rivers and a lot of people wouldn't really anticipate this. So I know for us that live in Roanoke, I don't really think that we think about bull sharks swimming in the Roanoke River and we're quite equipped for that. And they've even been swimming or spotted swimming as high north up the Mississippi River as Illinois. So we can imagine if there are people swimming in the river and they are to get a bull shark bite, that EMS might not be prepared for that. There may be a delay of care there. Um, bull sharks are also known to be very reactive and especially in warm waters. Okay, and then here are just some other risks that most of us take almost every day that is actually a riskier than getting in the water with a shark. So the common person tends to be fearful of sharks in water. Um, but I, what I want to point out is that if we look at uh, the number of shark bites compared to fatal dog bites, it's actually much higher and yet most of us still have dogs. Um, and then here, if we look at car accidents, someone's much more likely to die in a car accident than get bit by a shark or even to die being struck by lightning. So it's actually not very common to be bit by sharks, although people tend to think that if you enter the water that you are um, risking getting bit by a shark. So there are some things that make people a little bit more likely to get bit accidentally by sharks. One of them is spear fishing, which I talked about a little bit earlier. Poor visibility, a shark might just, um, you know, rather than exploring, they could just bite. Uh, mistaken identity. So if we look at this picture right here, we see what it looks like underneath from a man surfing, a sea lion, and then also a turtle. And to a shark, these can um, kind of all look similar. So they might mistake someone as prey. Um, if a person is swimming in a place that's known to be a food hotspot or maybe where there's a lot of blood or fish guts around, this could also excite the shark. But there's different things that people can do to decrease their chances of being bit by a shark. So one of these is using the buddy system. 
So we think of sharks as being the apex predators. And um, although that is true, they're not really going for the leaders of the pack, the strongest uh, sea lion in the group that's swimming. They like to go for the stragglers in the back, maybe the ones that are injured um, or slower than the rest. So just by swimming with a second person can decrease your risk of being targeted. Staying close to shore and out of sandbars for drop-offs is helpful for two reasons. One, if you're closer to shore, this can mean that if you're bit, um, you can get back to shore quicker and get help quicker, and therefore you have less chance of becoming a fatality. Also, if you aren't able to touch the floor um, or the sand in the water, then that makes it so a shark can swim up underneath you and bite you. You want to avoid being in the water during low light hours. And this is because certain species are going to be more active at hunting at dusk. And uh, we want to avoid swimming when bleeding. And I think that the first thing that people think of when they hear that is maybe don't go swimming when you're menstruating. Um, but there's actually hasn't been any links to any shark bites because of menstruation. And for some reason, something about the salt in the water, I, I really can explain the physics behind it, but this makes it so that um, the menstrual blood doesn't really flow out. So um, by this, we mean like if you have a superficial cut somewhere else in your body, then you would want to avoid swimming. But uh, swimming on a period, especially if uh, the woman's wearing a tampon, should not be something that would inherently attract a shark. Um, don't wear shiny jewelry just because this can uh, mimic what um, fish scales look like. And so we want to avoid that. Avoid uh, water that is uh, actively being fished in because there might be some uh, remnants there. Avoiding murky waters. The rest of these are, are a little bit more common sense. Avoid high contrast clothing. Refrain from excess splashing. You don't want to enter the shark if a shark has, or enter the waters if a shark has been spotted. You don't want to be harassing the sharks. Um, and then also, if we see any dolphins clustering or any of the pinnipeds are headed to shore, this could be something that alerts people that there is a threat in the water. And so, if you see them heading to shore, you should also head to shore. And then we don't want to be swimming with dogs or horses in the ocean because. Um, for some reason, the way that they swim can be perceived by the sharks as a uh, fish struggling, um, and that can excite them. Okay, and so what should you do if you are feeling like that you're being targeted by a shark? Um, one thing you do is uh, punch its gills or its nose. Um, I don't want to, uh, you know, say that you should abuse the shark or anything, but you really you just uh, got to give it a quick punch. And these are sensitive areas on the shark, so it should leave you alone afterwards. And then you can also redirect the nose. And this is just kind of like a quick push. Um, what I'm not saying is to try putting a shark into tonic immobility, which tonic immobility is the um, phenomenon that when you flip a shark over that it goes into a trans-like state. Um, this is because not all shark species are going to be able to go into tonic immobility. And some of these species, they do kind of snap out of it. It's not like they can stay in that forever. So if uh, you try to do this and the shark is snapping out of it, now you have a shark's mouth kind of right in front of you. Um, so we don't really want to play around with that. You just want to redirect the nose. Okay, any questions? Can you talk a little bit about why um, punching it in the nose or redirecting the nose is effective? What about that is redirection? Um, just because like you're showing it that you'll fight back it's not going to, you're not an easy catch. Um, more, it, it, that's pretty much what I've heard from that. Um, yeah, because it, if it wants to do like an exploratory bite, then I think if you get in front of it before it does that, that would reduce that risk. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, one tip that I've learned from diving with sharks also, this only works if you're scuba diving, but is you if you think the shark is um, kind of maybe coming towards you in a way that makes you uncomfortable or might be considering a bite, is to take your uh, spare regulator and blow bubbles at it, because that tends to kind of frighten them off. I like that one. Interesting. I believe it, though. Thanks for sharing. Okay. If that's all the questions, then I'll go ahead and move on. We'll leave sharks behind us and we'll talk about some other oceanic 
threats of penetrating wounds. So really quickly, I'm going to talk about sea lions and seals, sea urchins, barracuda, galefish, eels, and sawfish. Um, and so the way that we treat these are going to be very similar to how we treat any penetrating wounds from sharks, um, but I'm going to leave that to Dr. Alo to talk more about. Um, but first, I want to talk about the pinnipeds, and this is because a lot of people have a really hard time telling the difference between seals and sea lions. And so I think walruses are a little bit easier for people just because they have these tusks on them. Um, but there's a couple of different ways to tell seals and sea lions apart from each other. But what I think is the most foolproof way is to observe how they are moving around. So the sea lions are going to be using their actual flippers. Uh, so their front and their back flippers, they walk kind of like a lion would with their paws, whereas seals are going to do what's called galumping. And that is what that motion is called when they're bouncing on their bellies to move around. Uh, so I think that this is the easiest way to tell them apart. And you might kind of wonder about, well, fur seals are also walking like this. This is what a fur seal looks like. And the truth is they are more related to a sea lion than they are a seal. So they, they got misnamed. They should be a fur sea lion. Um, so if you just kind of keep that exception to the rule in your head, you should be able to tell sea lions apart from seals. And why we want to be able to tell those apart is because a sea lion is going to be probably more problematic than a seal. So sea lions are very territorial and they will attack either in the water or on the beach. I did my undergrad degree at uh, UC San Diego and we had both sea lions and seals at our nearby beaches. And it was really surprising what people would try to do, like go up to them, touch them, take selfies with them. And they get very mad. So I definitely would not recommend that for people. Um, something that I saw that I was actually quite skeptical when I first read it, but it was confirmed by the Marine Mammal Center, was that there was a sea lion attack on a 13-year-old girl who was surfing in Southern California. And they caught the sea lion. I guess someone was on shore kind of keeping track of it. And they saw that it had some sort of toxin and gave it encephalitis. So it's kind of seemed like they were describing it like as if it was rabid. Uh, so I don't know if there's going to be more about that coming out later. I haven't really heard too much about that, but uh, I'm curious to see if we're going to hear more about these toxic sea lions. Um, seals, when that you was, look into- That was the 2019. Sorry, that was recent, it, uh, pretty recent, just before COVID. Um, yeah. It was uh, 2019 and there's an interesting thing. Um, but awesome. Sorry to interrupt you. No, go ahead. If you have more to say, I'd love to hear. I will come back to me afterwards. You're doing, I'm, I want to hear you. <laughs> okay. Um, so seals, when you look into see at what, uh, they're biting on human patterns are, they really only bite if they're threatened. And so most of the articles that I read was talking about like people who were trying to grab their pups as they were nursing from them. So of course that's gonna put the seal in a defensive uh, mindset and want to help save their baby. So um, you don't wanna be touching the seal pups, especially if they're with the mom. Um, another thing that I saw, I did see an article about biologists who were trying to take blood samples from seals and they were pretty consistently getting bit. Um, but as you can imagine, the seals are uh, not enjoying that. So they're going to be defensive there as well. Okay, so next talking about sea urchins, what most often happens with sea urchins to get a penetrating wound is that people will step on them. And I want to point out that there are some uh, extra precautions that we want to take when it comes to treating sea urchins. One is that it's supposed to help if you soak the extremity in hot water, what's tolerable for the patient, um, just to that degree, and do that for about 30 to 90 minutes, and that seems to help with the pain. And if that's not enough, you want to supplement with uh, some more, like an analgesic or some other painkiller. Um, patients with C. urchin penetration, they might have a reactive neuropathy, which is responsive to a systemic corticosteroid. Um, and I thought this was interesting too, that secondary infections are common, but apparently not prophylaxis is not recommended. Um, so take that into account. I would think that if they're that common, you would want to treat prophylactically, but um, yeah, no, that's what I was reading. So this is what you would do if there is a secondary infection. 
Okay, and then Barracuda is another one that I want to talk about. So these are known to um, kind of trail snorkelers and divers, and they're very, very fast, and they're known to bite if they see something shiny. Just similar to the sharks, they can mistake um, anything shiny as fish scales. And this has happened uh, several times and caused a few fatalities from it. So it is something to think about. You want to avoid anything shiny. And then needlefish. Although needlefish can bite, where they really have an issue with people is that um, they have these beaks that are really strong and they tend to pierce people in the skin. So uh, you can see right here that this is um, pierced someone. This is someone in, uh, semi recently in Indonesia. And here you can see some imaging where the beak of the needlefish actually entered someone's spinal cord. Um, and also, even though we think of sharks as being the big threats in the ocean, there's actually, uh, it's more common to have a needlefish incident than a shark incident. Okay, and then eel bites. Eels in the ocean themselves are not really a big threat. They can bite if they feel cornered. Um, but most of the eel bites that will show up in the emergency department will be because of people sticking their hands into tanks. Um, people will have eels at their home in their home aquariums. And so this can be damaging on the skin because their teeth will jet backwards, making it so that they can hold on to their prey better. And something that we want to take into account with uh, these kind of bites is that there's a study done where they swabbed uh, the teeth of different aquarium eels and saw that they had a slightly different oral flora than uh, or oral microbiome compared to the oceanic eels. So we want to extend antibiotic coverage to uh, take that into consideration. And then sawfish, so these can also be a source of penetrating wounds as we see that there are these um, uh, teeth on the outside of their rostrum, but sawfish are pretty shy and they're almost extinct at this point. So they don't cause too much of a threat, but I did wanna show it compared to uh, a sawtooth pattern on an EKG. So I try to look up if this is, like, or like if there was a story behind how this got its name, I couldn't find anything, but I think that it just looks similar. So I think that this is where it got its name. Um, I think that's the easiest way for me to remember it as a second year med student trying to learn my EKGs. Okay, so that is really the bulk of what I got for you all. So just in conclusion, um, shark bites, they can be avoided if uh, precautions are taken. They are not as much of a threat as most people believe them to be. Um, and then also we want to be thinking about other things in the water other than sharks, such as our sea lions, seals, sea urchins, barracuda, needlefish, and eels. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. All right. Great job, Julia. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for her? Uh, any questions regarding this topic in general? Uh, otherwise, I think we can have um, Dr. Abo take over. All right, Ben, take it away. Awesome. Julia, that was wonderful. Um, and right on. There's a couple things um, topic-wise, and some of the things you, you questioned were in short, I'm going to answer right now for you. Um, and a couple little... Uh, tips uh, about it. And then I'm mostly going to leave this to more of a kind of a Q&A. Um, as said, um, oh, someone from Shark Week literally just called me. Um, so I'm Ben Abo. I'm a Florida manologist. I am an EMS and wilderness austere medicine physician down in uh, Florida. Um, I live in Naples. I started out residency in Miami Beach um, and Miami. I've been medical director for uh, Shark Week filming in Atchia Wild um, since about 2016, um, where we were teaching Shaquille and Neil how to make them go to sleep and do the nose push and Mike Tyson and everything. It's been fun, um, most in Atchia Wild. And then I also have a TV show, um, Otis, that's my assistant medical director, Otis. Um, the Kings of Pain, um, I'm a venomologist, I run the venom response teams and um and all so um a, a bunch of interesting things right so 
right on. There's a lot of misnomers about um, sharks. Oh, they can smell blood a mile away. Um, and that's actually been disproven. About a quarter mile away, yeah, it's about 25 parts per million. But as Julia said, you know, the water dilutes it down and things like that. Um, we have, and I've actually done some specific as talent, or I don't want to say that I'm talent. Um, as a subject matter expert, we did some experimentation for episodes of Shark Attack Files and Shark Week, um, where uh, we compared, you know, what might make a male more likely than female. And, you know, Julia hit the nail on the head um in terms of it's mostly us guys doing stuff and we're out there doing things it's that's why it's chromosomal um that being said it doesn't make it that it can't happen but it's not uh menstruating or anything like that it's going to cause it a lot of people ask me how to tell if there's like sharks in the water and i and i'm quite honest with them and i you know we're out there they people have these fears um and i like to take fears and actually make it more of a respect for the wildlife um, and I tell them, I make them go and they, they do the ladle test. Do you know what the ladle test is, Julia? So you get a ladle, like a kitchen soup ladle or a spoon or something like that. And uh, you go to the water and you get, fill it up about halfway. And you take a sip and if it tastes salty, there's sharks in the water. Um, the fact of the matter is there's sharks in the water. Um, and, but most of the time they don't want anything to do with us um they usually want to get away and things like that um so <laughs> yes uh so snake bites and shark bites are kind of excellent conditions very true um <laughs> oh. so anyway um you know there are instances where they're doing different things um i did investigate um we did an episode called hunt for lagertha lagertha is a tiger shark um, and there's a very interesting story as an episode on Shark Week last year, um, very rare that there were tiger sharks out in Cocos Island. If you don't know what Cocos Island is, it is a beautiful island, a uh, 32-hour boat ride off the coast of Costa Rica. Um, it's way out there. There's only two little huts in there for rangers. It's the southernmost island or landmass of North America. Um, it's actually the island that gave Michael Crichton the idea for Jurassic Park. And uh, so there was um, a novice swimmer, uh, sorry, scuba diver, and she was kind of all out. And this tiger shark did hunt her. Um, it was acting very erratic. And you can tell if they're just kind of curious, things like that. This actually, this picture behind me is uh, took it in Cocos. These are all great um, hammerheads where they were, our first dive, there were like 54 of them around us. And it was just amazing. But they, they didn't want to do stuff. But this one, when and the dive master noticed it, tried to get in the way, um, did a quick bite to the dive master, got his leg, and it went around him and got this female. And most likely when reviewing this, it was probably because of the how she was diving, using her arms, kind of flailing around and things like that. Um, similar to the worst shark attack in history, and that's the USS Indianapolis. This was uh, um, a naval ship that left from Mare Island, which is where my med school was um, in uh, the Bay Area of San Francisco. And they um, uh, were torpedoed by the Japanese in World War II, and you had hundreds of people in the water. Everyone that was either injured or flailing around, hypothermic, hyponatremic, acting altered, those were the ones that the, the white tip reef shark, or sorry, white tip sharks would kind of pick up. They were acting injured and things like that. And there were a lot of people that um, unfortunately were attacked. Um, it's a very interesting account of what was going on. Um, so, you know, it, it is possible. I just was filming with a uh, um, now dear friend of mine, Paul de Gelder, who's a famous, he's an Australian, uh, he's in the Australian forces, armed forces, no pun intended, because uh, he was on an exercise and, um, uh, he lost an arm and a leg to a bull shark attack. Um, and so he now advocates for sharks, even though he lost an arm and a leg. Um, advocating for wildlife did cost him an arm and a leg, I guess, but he's a great guy and good sport about it. About it. Um, and it was interesting um, kind of looking at that. So a lot goes into understanding the biology. Now, 
for all wildlife, it was really got me into it. And I just was on the, the news interview yesterday because we had a gator attack. If you understand, have an idea of the respect of the behavior of wildlife, you can really avoid a lot of these things. There are different things out there like um, that's been proven to make a little electric shield. Um, we've done a couple episodes about that, and I do have one um, around you to help make it less likely to have a shark-related um, incident. Um, but exactly as Julia said, it's usually mistaken or it's a test or you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. They're confused. Um, they usually don't kind of want to do that. Um, interestingly, in December, um, uh, two of the shark attacks in the United States, I was there. Um, one was here in Naples, Florida. It was our first shark bite since 2006. Very rare around here. Um, this was a bull shark, um, but we just had Hurricane Ian here, and a lot of the large fish um, were kind of pushed more towards inland, and so sharks were following food. Also, this was a hydrofoiler. So that has the fin underneath them for whatever reason that and helicopters patterns when we do our dive training from helicopter rescue, we have to keep moving the helicopter when we're jumping out because after a bit it attracts the sharks. Maybe it's radio frequencies, maybe it's the movement on the surface of the water, a bunch of us jumping out of helicopters, I don't know, but it attracts them. So this one, this guy went up and he's you know hydrofoiling, he goes up and when he lands back down, his he, his knees are bent and his buttocks went in the water and boom, that's when the bull shark just got his thigh. Pretty bad bite. Um, and the other, I was on vacation and this was the death of a woman um, that we think was a tiger shark. About uh, 250 yards from the condo I was renting um, at a conference in uh, in Maui. Um, so it's pretty interesting, but, but be safe in things. Um, I think it was, I'm looking at the names. Sarah Kirkpatrick um, brought up, I think, about the regulator um, with the bubbles and all. Um, yeah, that was me. That, yeah. So they they use their all their different senses that Julie was talking about in different ways and at different parts. And their their um, the little electric receptors, other than their lateral lines, are very sensitive. But if you throw that off um, at the last minute, it kind of like they slightly miss the target. It's like me trying to play basketball because I'm not a good athlete, um, right? So it's just slightly off. So that last bit effort, so that's why if you punch the nose um, and things like that, it kind of stuns it, throws it off and it, it kind of localizes it. The pushing the nose off and redirecting it, um, it's usually because um, behavior-wise they were testing, kind of seeing and they kind of go with the flow. They're like, oh, okay, I'm not gonna bother um, kind of thing. I definitely don't recommend. I my recommendation is is the same as Julia's is to not try the roll to put them to sleep. Um, just don't do that unless you want to see me in the the ER episode of Shark Attack Survivors. Um, but a lot of it's about the behavior. I just had a second gator bite um, here and doing a training thing because of that. Um, but, but understanding that kind of what's going on and we're, we're understanding more and more about these beautiful creatures, sharks, seal, sea lions. One thing I'll say before I kind of get into the, um, two things before I get into kind of Q and A, cause I want to see what you want to know about, um, in terms of everything. Um, one, the, I will say as an EMS physician, that a shark in the river where you don't expect it. EMS is prepared because it's just like any other trauma. Um, so they'll do tourniquets and things like that. Now, they're probably not going to believe the person like, oh, I got bit by a shark, you know, and it's like, right. But, um, you know, but they're going to be prepared. But that's the EMS physician to me. Love you, mean it, you know. Um, and uh, the other thing, too, is um, I did med school in the Bay Area, Mare Island, and I would go to Point Reyes. Um, which is right by one of the largest um, breeding grounds for great whites. Um, and there are signs, you know, no swimming in the water, this and that. There are also signs to not disturb the elephant seals. And there are literally signs that say, don't take pictures of your children on an elephant seal. And you know it's because someone did that. Probably someone from Florida is visiting and they put their kid on these. It's like, what? 
Um, so I, and I used to go scuba diving all the time in Monterey, um, and stuff. And I'm the, the seals or uh, seals are kind of playing with this. I'm like, Oh, cool. And I'm like, Oh shoot, there's probably sharks around here. Um, so I got out of the water kind of quickly. I was a little afraid. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it, it gets pretty interesting, but those are wonderful things. And then the sea urchin too, um, for that King of the Pain show, if you're not familiar with it, um, is where it's kind of medical jackass show where <laughs> two guys go around the world getting bit stung on purpose. And I talk about the toxins or the wildlife and I save them. Um, and we did do a sea urchin episode. So, um, um, interestingly, you can also soften it, uh, to make it easier to take out with the, um, with, um, like olive oil and stuff. Um, but it's one of the few penetrating injuries of marine wildlife that you don't need prophylactic antibiotics. Um, and it's, I just don't need it. It's pretty good, but usually you can kind of soften it. You can kind of get it out, um, ultrasound pretty well. Um, in Indonesia, the treatment for um, sea urchins is bamboo. Interesting, right? You're like, huh? And does anyone know what you do with that bamboo? So you cut a piece of bamboo, like a big strand or whatever. And so if the, let's say they stepped on it, you have them lay down on their stomach. So their feet, the bottom of their feet are exposed and you take the bamboo and you just beat the bottom of their feet and it's soft. I don't recommend it, but that's what they do in Indonesia, in Bali, um, where it kind of softens it up and breaks it up. I don't recommend that. Um, so um, with that, again, Julia, great job. Um, does anybody have any questions about sharks or wildlife or Shark Week filming or anything? I have a, a quick question. Um, so obviously, if someone is bitten by a shark, they're probably going to be in a state of panic and not thinking too well. And there are some common sense things you can do if you do get bitten. But I'm curious to hear what you have to say. What would you recommend to someone who gets bitten? What would you say to take as like their next step of actions or how to react? So first, I'd say before you get bit, that's a wonderful question. You know, what to, what would I suggest to people that get bit? First, obviously, if you could prevent it, great. Um, but I don't do anything on the water or in the water without a tourniquet. I don't. I, whenever I'm filming, all my camera people, the talent, myself, we have multiple tourniquets on. Um, when I'm surfing, my surf leash is actually a particular brand that can be made into a proven commercial tourniquet. Um, I'm even paddle boarding or kayaking and I have a tourniquet, which I've used, um, uh, for incidents and stuff and have used it. So I would be prepared, um, just in case, um, and not be stupid. Don't, don't expect like, uh, um, there was, a uh, people selling this like sunscreen that's UPF, you know, SPF, uh, 50, but also keeps sharks away from you. That's not going to work. Um, some of the electric bands and the anklets now, some of the neural ones make a little field um, and it kind of pisses them off a little bit. Um, some do actually work. Two of the episodes for Shark Week this year do involve that and it's pretty cool and I have it. Um, it can be integrated into your surfboard or under the kayak or you, it's wearable. I have one that's wearable just to make it less likely. Um, but I still go diving with sharks and I just don't turn it on. Um, but if you do get bitten, the first thing that you want to do is try to stay calm. Easier said than done, but try to stay calm. Um, if the shark is still there or, or it's close or anything like that, um, as said, kind of just poke at its eye, punch the gill, punch the eye, uh, try to push it off. Um, but most of the time, it's going to be a quick bite and done and go off. So you want to stay calm. And you want to get back to the boat or get back to shore as soon as possible. Um, if you have a tourniquet, I wouldn't even try to be like in the water, like, let me see if it's bad or not. Just if I'm bit on an extremity in the water, I'm just putting the tourniquet on and then I'll look how bad it is. Because I don't want to delay anything. Water makes it really hard to figure out how much blood loss do you actually have or something like that. Um, and then get, you know, get out of the water as soon as you can. 
Now, the only episode of Shark Week or Nat Geo Wild and that stuff that I refused to do um, was Jackass. Um, because they wanted to do some things and I wasn't approving of it. That being said, I still had to get involved um, because they tried to reenact the Happy Days scene where he is on uh, water skis and he jumps the shark. Um, and he did it. He landed right on the shark. They were pissing it off. Um, and in an area too where um, they are trained for feeding. So just like kind of when you're spear fishing, something like that. These are sharks that are very prone to humans feeding them. So you slap things on the surface, they're expecting to be fed. They're coming to say hi and feed me. Um, so he got bit. The medic that took it, um, he jumped into the water to get him out and didn't use a tourniquet. Um, and in reality, the wound wasn't too bad, but I had to get involved because um, they were trying to evacuate him and all this stuff and da-da-da when... If I was there, I would have just irrigated it out, um, give them antibiotics and treat it on scene. But um, yeah. Um, so, you know, tourniquet, do what you need to do, try to stay calm as much as possible um, and, and uh, seek help. Well, thank you. My pleasure. Any other questions? And you mentioned that you do dive with sharks. And I feel like I see that as a, um, you know, a tourist thing a lot of times to swim the sharks. What, what's the line with safety? Is that a certain setting and a certain type of shark? Or is that just precautions that you take during that activity? Or how do, how do you think through that? That's a great question. Um, in terms of, like, there are a variety of sharks all over. And we, heck, we just had um, another killer, you know, orca, excuse me, an orca sighting here in Florida. Like, the, it's a little weird. A lot of the great white sharks, you know, we, we can't really go off the South Africa anymore to see it as much. We actually have to go to Nova Scotia now to film it because of unfortunate finning and slaughtering and um, global warming and different things like that. And Guadalupe Island which is beautiful, um, great white, uh, great place to see all sorts of wildlife, um, is now cut off from tourists. I think I have an opinion about Mexican government and the Mexican cartel, but that's a whole other thing. Um, and, and all. So, you know, a lot of it is tourist driven. Um, I was just filming in Tiger Beach in the Bahamas. Um, and that's a place where luckily they, they warn you and they say, hey, um, if you, you don't throw anything in the water, you don't touch, you don't put your hands in the water unless it's guided and you're jumping in. We look to make sure it's clear. Um, and then we go in and then we let the sharks kind of come to us and we give some warnings in terms of the behavior and all. And we're around tiger, like I'm literally going and diving with tiger sharks and bull sharks. Um, we're not doing with the cage. Um, we brief about the behavior and stuff like that, but you don't want to just like throw orange peels into the water because they're going to be coming, get curious because they're conditioned to being fed. Um, so, you know, if you're going into waters that are more likely to be great white, um, I'm, I'm a big advocate for cages. <laughs> um, uh, well-known Shark Week videographer who happens to live here in town and one of my best friends, Andy Casagrande, um, he's gotten some great footage and he gets out of the cage. But first, He's even in the cage, and depending on the behavior of the great white and stuff, he will then get out um, and interact with it. Um, you know, he's not going and touching, he's not petting, he's not giving a hug, but he's diving outside of the cage. Um, so basically, similar to knowing, understanding the behavior, depending on where you're at, understand if it's a place where they kind of feed them and condition them, um, get an idea of who you're going out with have a rescue plan or game plan, definitely have travel medicals insurance um, uh, and things like that. But um, basically, if you find groups that are um, all about concert, like truly about conservation and stuff, they're probably taking better care of the sharks um, and care about them. And therefore, they're going to take safer, better care of you. Um, 
for instance, based out of the Bahamas, my friend Neil, um, he has a uh, shark experience and, and uh, hammerhead tour um, and goes to Tiger, Tiger Beach and the Tiger, you know, and that, that's one of those tourist driven ways so we can get people to understand the wildlife, do things safely, see things safely. They'll help us take care of and conserve our wildlife. Gotcha. I've got a question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was just wondering, in your professional opinion, is there like an eco-conscious way to dive with great whites, or because of the chumming, is it always an issue? Um. Yeah. No. So not all are going to chum, um, and depending where you're at, Guadalupe, we we didn't chum, um, um, and depending on where you're at in these different places. Um, chumming can be done responsibly. Um, I do believe, um, where it's not kind of done this and that all the time. Um, but, uh, for, in terms of great whites, it's all about going to where they, are. Uh, um, uh, are, you know, it's temperature driven and things like that. Um, and I, they, it can be done responsibly. Um, that, I mean, I do wish they were like cages on sailboats to get to these places as opposed to like big diesel boats getting out there. Um, the Hunt for Ligurtho is this great former Japanese fishing vessel converted to a shark research vessel. Um, we lived on it for two and a half weeks. The only sand that my feet touched um, were at the bottom underneath where this picture behind me was taken. Um, at uh, 68 to 78 feet. Um, but, um, you know, that's, there, there's a lot of different things about being ecologically sound uh, that gets into it. But you can, there are different groups, certain groups. And if you email me, I'll, I will gladly give people um, contacts of those that I trust that care about the environment that um, do everything um, right. Dr. Abo, I have a question about uh, pre-hospital or uh, austere medic medicine antibiotic coverage, and then also a scenario yeah. from when I was a baby medic that's kind of stuck with me. Um, so first, I guess the antibiotic coverage for austere or pre-hospital. Um, you know, broad coverage, and you're worrying about the Vibrio pseudomonas, um, similar to um, what was in um, Julia's lecture there on the slide. Um, when we're talking about specifically what EMS might be carrying, um, a lot depends on the service. Um, how often is it being used? What's the cost? What's the shelf life? Um, maybe what's the biogram in that area for different things? Um, me, I, when I travel and I do things, I'm prepared. I have Recephin, I've got Cipro, I've got Azithro, I've got a bit of everything, um, for depending on what's going on. What about Moxa? What's that? Moxifloxin, any just general penetrating or? Um, sometimes I carry it, um, but again, it, it depends on the EMS service, what's around there and what's, what's more likely. Um, and moxifloxacin can actually be really expensive, really, really expensive. Okay. Uh, and then I guess the follow-up question, when I was a baby medic uh, on the Gulf Coast of Florida, I had a more or less an older chap who was out fi fishing. A barracuda is the thing that he hooks. It comes out of the water and it's more of a blunt trauma to his face. Um, minor penetrating trauma just by the, by the teeth that were sticking out to his cheek, minimal blood loss, probable ocular, uh, I don't know, or like orbital fracture for sure. Um, I don't think the globe is ruptured, but he had this persistent hypotension throughout with us on the way to the hospital and then in hospital. And the only thing the trauma surgeon just, I mean, he was whisked away pretty quickly just because of the nature of the injury. Um, and he said, oh, ocular trauma, blunt injury. This is just something that we see, persistent hypotension. Now, later on flying and doing the things that I do, is it, you know, does this guy just have a head bleed that we didn't know about then? 
it was hard to follow up back then also. So I just didn't know if there was any other like similarities that you might have seen of odd ocular blunt trauma with systemic hypotension. That is a wonderful question. I have never experienced that or seen that. Yeah. Um, but uh, email me. I'm going to kind of do a little dig to kind of follow up on that a little more. Um, okay. But yeah, I've never experienced that or heard of specifically a case. Um, and in my write-ups for book chapters and think, or journal articles, I haven't come across that yet. Um, can't say it can't happen. You know, and it's interesting, you know, it's blood injury. Um, you know, we were talking about the needle fish, um, you know, going through the neck, um, you know, some of it is, you know, at wildlife, when it penetrates and things like that, like jaws and things like that, it can cut, it can lacerate, which laceration is technically a tear, the puncture, you can have bone crushing when a shark bites you, you I mean, if it really wants to, sometimes it can actually fracture the bones, um, and things like that. Um, but uh, um, it, it gets interesting. And, you know, there are only two deaths from stingrays that I know of. Um, you know, speaking about the blunt and the different things that can happen that you don't expect. One is, court, of course, Steve Irwin. Very unfortunate. Um, he stabbed. Would he have lived if they didn't take it out? Maybe. I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, but in Fort Lauderdale, there was a gentleman who we have in Florida called the Spotted Eagle Ray because it's got spots and it's called Eagle because it jumps out of the water every so often. So this guy's on a boat in Fort Lauderdale. The Eagle Ray jumps out this direction and they cross paths and it lands on his lap. The stingray is startled because he's kind of over it. Boom. The tail goes, it wasn't the venom that got him. It went through both ventricles. He survived because the tail was cut off, unfortunately. Um, and I have this in my marine envenomation lecture. Um, and he went to the OR. Then the firefighters talked to the, took to the taxidermist, the stingray, and um, they gave it to him. Um, but he survived. But the other death that I know of, um, and even back to Aristotle's time, they talked about stingrays and stuff, the devils of the deep and mysterious things. There's a woman vacationing from Michigan in the Keys. And... Again, a spotted eagle ray, the, she's on a boat and it's going this way and a spotted eagle ray jumps up this way and they cross paths. Blunt injury, it hits her, never penetrates her with the, with the tail. It knocked her over and she's on head thinners and she died of a head bleed in the keys. Um, so <laughs> these are the other sides of what I like to call negative encounters with wildlife. I try not to use the word attack. Um, Listen, I'm trying to like sell the headlines or something because um, a lot of times it's not necessarily the animal's fault. It's the ant sharks do shark things. Gators do gator things. Snakes do snake things, you know? Um, so it kind of uh, depends um, with that. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a quick question if possible. Yeah. Um, so a little less medical me uh, related um, in addition to the shark shields, um, are they still working on the shark bomb? It was something when I was at UM where they essentially, I think they took parts of sharks that were carcasses, uh, concentrated it, and used it as like a water activated kind of thing, and it would disperse the sharks. I think it was even on. Shark yeah, Week like putting the heads of on stake, like heads of your enemies on a stake kind of thought yeah. process. Um, yeah. That was it was disproven. That was, that's okay. all stopped. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm very glad it's not because part of that is they're killing sharks yeah. for that. Um, but the thought process was like, the sharks know that a shark's getting killed um, and would kind of more scare it away. Um, but yeah, no, good question. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a quick question. Uh, sorry if this was already uh, mentioned, but other than things like, um, you know, like the suits and, and things like that preventative, if you're in the water and you encounter a shark, what's kind of the best way to act? I know, you know they have stuff like bears and things like that, but in terms of a shark, do you just stay calm and it'll go about its business basically? 
Um, so it depends. Um, you know, most commonly it's like a test bite or investigative or they, they don't really realize what it is or it's, it's mistaken identity. Um, and so it's a quick nip and they go and, and uh, Julia did mention this and then uh, I kind of did also, but, um, uh, but if it's not, and it's still actually, it's still right there. Um, you want to like hit the gills, hit the eye, kind of poke at it. Um, preferably, um, you're not going to stab it in the eye or gills because you just want to get it off of you. Um, but um, yeah, you'll, you'll need to kind of fight back a little bit. Um, I wouldn't play, play possum, play dead or anything like that. Um, it's not like a bear where, you know, the grizzlies or the brown bears tend to like, like attack and then they back off a bit and then they're watching to see if you're going to move. So you got to stay completely still or anything like that. Thank you. But just to clarify, sure. that's if a shark attacks you, right? Not just if you see a shark. Yes, that is. <laughs> thank you. That's if a shark actually attacks you, right? Um, in fact, I'd say I'd let it penetrate skin before I did that. Sharks are going to be very curious. They come up. Uh, my favorite is the grit. It is, I do love great whites too. Um, that's why I think they're so great. Um, they're not just white sharks. Um, but uh, hammerheads, stuff very curious, um, very startled. You know, when I got this picture, um, we were down and this spot was about 90 feet and there's this ledge and a uh, camera person and I went down and we're, we're sitting on this ledge, literally sitting there like fins and oh, da, 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 da. And others were lower on the ground and I were there, my back's up against the wall and these hammerheads are all coming. They came super close. And then I moved a little bit and then it's like, oh, you're there? <laughs> Um, and they just kind of scurried off, but they usually get pretty curious. And there's some, a lot of pictures of us with tiger sharks without, um, without uh, the episode, look at with Shaquille O'Neal and, and um, um, Shaq week, so to speak. And um, even Mike Tyson, yeah, they came close and they're just swimming around and doing their thing. Um, it's usually not uh, too bad, but if they attack, that's, thank you. I think that was Sarah for that, that pointed that out. That's a, that's only when you're going to do it, not if they're swimming around or coming close. And I'm always looking at all wildlife, how it's acting. If, you know, the reef tip sharks and things like that, if it's acting really skittish and kind of going off, then I'm like, I'm a bit more on edge. And I kind of bring the attention to everyone. I'll even interrupt filming just to bring the attention of everybody to that, to keep an eye on it. Can you walk us through how you devise your emergency accident, uh, action plans for your different uh, involvement with these programs? Yeah, um, basically, and that's, I think that's probably the, why I got, just got a phone call another, because we're doing one other episode left um, for this year. Um, but um, it depends on where it's at, when it's at. I look at everything in terms of weather, what it tends to be. Um, because most people are hurt. like, if, so if I'm doing shark week, it's usually not the shark that I'm worried about. I'm worried about it, but I'm not as worried about it. Usually people get hurt or sick because they eat bad food or they are in Mexico and they put ice because they get a margarita. Um, they get GI illnesses or they forget they're on a boat and they sit up too fast. They hit their head or they're getting out of the water, um, or hunt for Ligurtha. Um, I said to the sound guy, I called his name and he dislocated his toe because um, he kicked something accidentally. I had to pop it back into place and then we went diving. Um, so, but I take everything in terms of the weather, the water conditions into effect, geographically where we go, is it safe uh, socially? Um, what's going on with the country or the local region? Um, I see if there's any medical conditions that the people have. And then um, I also consider where the nearest sites are. Is there an urgent care? Although most of the time I just handle it myself because I bring wound care supplies. I bring uh, my ultrasound, things like that. But sometimes I'm on these like little, tiny little planes. So I have to really compress my stuff, bring scuba gear plus this. Um, so I'll limit sometimes the meds and equipment that I have. 
But I look at, is there urgent care around? Is there a hospital? The Bahamas doesn't have a trauma center. Is, the, is there a dive facility? So let's say Cocos Island, for example. If I needed to get anyone to a hospital, it's a 40-hour endeavor. 32 to 36 hours by water. Um, the plane, planes can't get out there. Seaplanes aren't getting out there. Um, they can maybe rendezvous. So sometimes I'll, I'll plan for a safety, like a speedboat. Um, and I have the closest point. Um, we're in certain parts of the Bahamas. I'm like, all right, we're the closest point of approach is going to be Jupiter, Florida versus Miami. Um, and is it a trauma center? Is it stimular? Is, are they operating the, the um, dive chamber? I happen to know next, there's one public dive chamber in the Bahamas. There's another private one. I happen to know the people that run that. So if I ran into an issue, I can um, do that also. So I consider all these things. And I also look at this, the script. Sharks don't follow scripts because they can't read very well. Their glasses fall off when they're swimming around. And, but the general script in terms of, is it a night dive? Is it a day dive? Time of year and stuff? Is it breeding grounds? All that, I take all that into consideration and I come up with the overall plan. Can you also walk us through how you kind of devise the liability and like the insurance coverage and all that from providing medical care on things like this? Like, do you have an attorney to set this all up for you or how does that work? <laughs> um, so it's mostly covered and underwritten, you know, so first off, we all have to have our, um, um, I highly recommend the Dan insurance because if it's a dive related emergency, it'll help cover that. Um, uh, so that for number one, number two, um, it, it's all for me under workman's comp and things filmed. And so my contract in terms of liability and stuff, it's covered by Disney, um, which is Nat Geo now, um, Discovery Channel, um, and different things like that. So it's, it's underwritten. You can imagine, um, something that's Disney is going to be pretty ironclad, um, and protective. Um, and from a, a personal note, you know, sometimes I do it where they're just paying my ABO emergency consulting and I have malpractice. I have personal liability or workman's comp do that. And sometimes I just, I do a kind of a loaner packet where basically I am loaning myself or one of my medics out to that company and they pay me an hourly wage and therefore I'm covered under their workman's comp and uh i have liability or non-liability um type statements that everyone fills out also uh, um i do contracting also for risk management um companies that do the risk assessments um and that helps get me um, better insurance coverage and then ends up making all the insurance a lot cheaper because they know that i'm really looking into it Does anybody have any more questions? I have one more quick question. I'm just generally curious, have you ever been bitten by a shark or had an encounter with an animal that went in a negative manner um, or any close calls? Um, have I been bit or had um, close calls or been bit? Um, my my ex-girlfriend doesn't count, right? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I have not been bit by a snake. I have not been um, bit by a shark. Um, I almost did when we were putting in um, GPS. Shark skin is really thick. So in Cocos, we, we were bringing them on. Uh, we bring them onto the back of the boat. We put a hose of water into its mouth so it can run air, so it can still breathe and it's on there. Um, make a quick incision, put a GPS tracker in so we can help study them. Um, and all, and then suture it up. Um, and then the, the hose kind of got caught on the, um, on the, uh, teeth and I was trying to help do that. And that's where I almost got bit. Um, and, um, there was a, uh, black tip shark that was getting a pretty antsy around and, um, I felt uncomfortable when we, when we happened to be filming and I went over, um, to get in the way between someone else and it. 
um, to kind of push it off. Um, and that's the only time that that kind of came close um, with it. Otherwise, I've I've been. I need wood to knock on. I've been pretty good. I haven't had any particularly close. The only for me, the only other close encounters were where I'm putting myself in there because I'm doing a save or I'm I'm in charge of safety or something like that. Um, and I'm keeping an eye out for somebody else. If one of our students or residents or participants wanted to get involved in medical care and you know, kind of along the lines of what you've done, how did you get started with all of this? So um, accidentally, so I care about the wildlife and the environment and stuff. Um, having done residency and being an EMS physician in Miami, um, I do a lot with the Miami-Dade Fireboat. There actually used to be a TV show called Danger Coast about the Miami-Dade Fireboat, um, which is just a trauma ambulance out on the water, <laughs> um, which is interesting. And um, the producer, it's not like Discovery Channel just set, hires all these videographers and says, go forth and film. They subcontracted a bunch of different production companies. And one of these production companies had the producer um, that did Danger Coast. And he contacted Nick DiGiacomo, one of my best friends from the fireboat, and said, hey, we need more rescue safety divers we'll, like for an episode of Shark Week. Are you interested? And he's like, well, there's only one doc that I'll ever work with um, who's perfect, who's wilderness medicine and this and that. It's it's our Dr. Abel. Um, so that got me my first episode of um, Laws of Jaws, it was called, in 2016 where we did, it was like Mythbusters about sharks and we tested like shark things and are they more likely to attack windsurfers or things like that. Um, fun fact, I, had, I was actually the second time I ever flew my drone and uh, some of my drone footage was in it. I suddenly became a professional videographer or droner. Um, and since then um, I saw, you know, I was there for safety prep, did the evacuation plan as a former medic and stuff and evacuation doc. Um, I, I know how to kind of run those ins and outs. And I saw Niche and I was like, well, you could just have basically a set medic with just, they can, you know, bring an AED and do CPR and put on a tourniquet. Um, and I decided to start making it more of a concierge film medicine thing. Um, and the production companies just really started calling me. Um, and that's kind of really how it, how it got into it. Um, that was at least my story out of it for the shark um, related stuff. And did you just happen to have a couple of buddies that like getting stung by <laughs> painful, <laughs> painful bugs? So, <laughs> oh man. So that show Kings of pain. Um, I didn't know those guys beforehand. Um, and uh, basically uh, they initially wanted the like, three main talent. Um, they went to Sean Bush, you know, great, great friend of mine. He's another toxinologist, the uh, ER doc and shark, uh, it's a shark snake um, specialist, venom specialist. Um, and he's like, I can't do it. You need this guy, Dr. Avo. And they contacted me and, you know, knowing someone who knows about the venom can talk on TV about it and the toxins and different stuff like that. Plus, me having a wilderness medicine, EMS, austere care background. They were like all about it. So I was able to not just be like a talking head on TV. I was able to do, I got paid as the talent, the head on talking head on TV, emergency action plan, the set medic, the set doctor. I did the approval of everything um, uh, and all. And that's what really uh, kind of led to that. And that's where I met the guys. Now, the show initially started with Rob, who happens to be from the same high school my brother's ex-girlfriend went to in the middle of Oklahoma. What the heck are the chances? But it also initially started off with a South African guy named Dingo. Um, but after we tried to start filming the first episode, I unfortunately had to fire Dingo. Or... Um, cause we had an incident where in the middle of the Bolivian jungle, um, where he was in full anaphylactic shock, um, 
it turned into like we're in the middle of nowhere and you have to like um hit him with epi pen and start an iv and give him more epi and then um the other the other medic that I had there um lieutenant rivera from the venom 2 response team um i'm telling him how to cut open an epi pen to get other doses out because there's about three doses in there um and uh, I was making from the EpiPen, the extra doses you pull out of there, where you're making an epinephrine infusion. And he was on an Epi infusion for three days and the clinics didn't have anything. And it was a whole thing. So we had to fire him. And then they, they hired um, Adam from Perth, Australia. That's where I met him. Now these, these guys are some of my best friends. I still think they're nuts. Um, uh, the show is the most watched, most popular show in the history of the History Channel. It's huge in different countries. The ads for it are really funny. There's a really hokey German one. It made prime time there. And uh, um, it is a video montage of my facial expressions in the background. And at the bottom, it says, um, if this is your doctor's face, you should be worried. Um, so yeah, I don't recommend getting bit um, and all. And uh, But now I'm pretty close with them. <laughs> right, any other questions can we, can we or does anyone up? know what the the great white's name in finding nemo is bruce hi my name's bruce yeah do you know why his name is bruce I do julia not. do you know i don't so when they filmed jaws the big animatronic shark was named Bruce. Why did the cast name it Bruce? Because Steven Spielberg's lawyer, at least at the time, his name was Bruce. And he apparently was very disliked on set. Um, so they named this big monstrous shark, Gary Shark Bruce. And so that's why Nemo's Great White Shark is also named Bruce. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, I think more in the lines of like uh, for eel bites, I know Julia was talking about um, how you can get differing flora from them. Yeah. What do you do mm -hmm. in terms of like the actual pharyngeal jaw side of the bite? Because they have the secondary jaw and that's usually why you can't get them off of things. Um, so yeah. Um, although most of the, the people that have been bit by eels, it usually doesn't involve that secondary jaw, the pharyngeal jaw. Um, wildlife, it does and things like that, and it's there. Um, and that's more of a, because they're biting for food as opposed to a defensive bite. Okay. Thank you. No, kings of pain, we did not do an eel bite. No. no. <laughs> Some people have limits. Good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions about specific care or planning or do I get stressed out? Anything? Um, for like on set, do you guys, uh, is there any utilization of the... Um, it's kind of like a Bluetooth receiver on the stage one of a regulator where you can actually track to see um, what's going on in terms of air supply and like position of people. Um, is there any, I guess, logistics in terms of actually keeping account of where everyone's at? Great question. So logistics costs money. Technology costs money. Um, so I always have a visual cue and we always have a game plan. So I review before we get in the water every day, no matter what, we go over the safety plan, the evacuation plan. Um, the captain's in charge, but medically I'm in charge. Um, and like, these are the plans. If something happens, you just work on getting out of the water and just stay quiet and wait for instructions. Don't try to help. Don't jump in. Let us do our things. Um, the camera guys all have a safety diver behind them, keeping an eye um and all and so we plan that whole thing out um i do have communications with most people we all call, have what's called ots so it's a we have a microphone we have a walkie-talkie system under there um 
so between the two, the masks and it also comes to the surface because we have a receiver that goes out it works pretty well there's another company that has one out um but in terms of so we're talking with that and sometimes i have by and this is just based on like um you know heart rate trackers and things like that i have some of their vital signs because we were doing that as an experiment but most that gets pretty hard to do um it's mostly visual thing and based on communications for that not like a gps locator or something like that um that being said i do have um i put on most people if the current is strong at all and the visibility is down at all i have these little um, gps strobe light little emergency things so that if something happens uh, they can go to the surface and pull it. And so I'll be able to find them um, if something's separated. And that's me kind of nerding out. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. If anyone has a hookup on me, that stuff, uh, would we'll love a discount because I'll, I'll gladly use. Check with the RJ Dunlap lab in Miami. Maybe they might. I don't know if they still get, they used to have a dive sponsorship, I think, through, I think, Cressy originally, but I will I'm not sure if this is the I case. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other questions, comments about the, today's topic or questions on Julia's presentation or anything regarding Sharks and sea life. All right, I think we're at the hour and a half point and we've covered quite a bit. Uh, I'm gonna end recording now and uh, we'll continue chat if anybody wants to keep going off recording. Thanks for joining everybody. I'll see you next month. We are covering foot care um, in the austere setting next month. Really important in marathons, ultra -th marathons. A lot of us do race support. So um, pretty useful topic, actually. Also disaster we... response. Mm -hmm. Very, very apropos. It came up a lot in Hurricane Ian and Surfside building collapse. So it's a very good topic to, because uh, you don't want to foot the bill on those injuries. <laughs> With that, I'm going to stop. <laughs> <laughs>